the average stay after a cystectomy, uh, however, whatever you do with a diversion or reconstruction, is probably around eight to ten days. Uh, you could get away with less for the less invasive forms of robotic um, surgery. It might be a day or two less on average. That, the recovery after surgery always depends what you mean by recovery. Uh, certainly, we looked at that years ago in terms of standard open surgery and. Uh, probably three months. Well, cystectomy is a major operation, and I always tell patients it's like having two operations. You've got to take the thing out, which is a major operation in itself, and then you've got to do another bowel operation to create a diversion or a new bladder. So it's like having two major procedures at once. Uh, it is potentially dangerous. Some of the mortality, you know, dying from the operation used to be 10%, and not you know, 25 or 30 years ago. It's it's something around 0.5% now, but it's not zero. Uh, there is a potential life-threatening risk, particularly when you're dealing with some men particularly who have been smokers, who've worked in industry, they're probably not the fittest group of people to work with. Um, generally, however, the main, thing, uh, the, the main complications we worry about are infection in the post-operative period, uh, which can be dealt with if caught early. Uh, like any major surgery, thromboembolism, in other words, a deep vein thrombosis in the leg or a pulmonary embolus, we try to reduce that risk by using uh, blood thinning injections prophylactic for a month or so afterwards. Um, issues with any any time, whether you do a reconstruction or an ideal conduit, you have to remove a bit of intestine and join the ends together. So the biggest um, delay is getting the bowels moving again and being sure everything's healed up. Any failure of that healing is, is where you can get a major complication if you get leakage of bowel contents. Um, so uh, in historical series, that could be as high as 8 to 10%. It's, it's much lower than that now, but uh, you know, delay of bowel function is seen often by people as a complication. In fact, it's just part of the normal recovery process in some ways. Um, so, so healing up of the bowels, infection, from um, embolism in the early stage of during operation, bleeding, but again, that's pretty, uh, you know, pretty low rate of uh, ma major hemorrhage now, but it's still a slight risk. The other complication of major pelvic surgery, particularly around the prostate and bladder in men and around the bladder and vagina in women, is, is change in sexual function. If, if, you, if you haven't got a prostate, you can't produce ejaculate. The nerves that give a man an erection lie behind the prostate, though you can be careful with them. However careful you are, there's an incidence of short, medium and sometimes long-term loss of erections. Uh, and women have, have similar nerves that go behind the bladder and the vagina that go down to the clitoris so you can get a loss and change in, in sexual function in women if you, uh, if you um, uh, remove radically the whole bladder and, and that, that area. So I, I guess uh, sexual function has often been uh, focused on in men, but both sexes in fact it can have changes in that if, after pelvic surgery. I mean, the main worry about a near bladder compared to a conduit is that people have it done because they feel they're going to be passing urine normally. And many of them do, but you, it's not a normal bladder. It takes a little while for it to get used to filling and emptying. You don't have the normal sensation, although weirdly enough some people do, even though they haven't got their bladder. Uh, but you do, you, you have to get used to uh, maybe responding to different signals. So it's a bit of training around getting some control back of the bladder. Um, even then, in men, somewhere between 10 and 40 percent, in my hands about 10, but you know, some series of 30 to 40 percent will have some long-term control issues. That might be fairly minor, but it's still something that wasn't there before. In women, that's a bit lower. Women seem to, to do better with, 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 uh, with a reconstruction, although far fewer get it. Um, but so I, I guess incontinence is the main one. I mean, the complications of living with a, an ideal conduit um, are, well, in the short term, you've got to get your head around the fact you've got a stone, you've got something poking out the abdomen that's producing urine much of the time with a bag over it. Uh, and it's certainly known from stoma groups, mainly, I think, well, more often through those who had stomas for bowel problems, that there's a bit of a psychological issue there. It seems to be a bit, a bit less prevalent in those who've got urinary stomas. Well, I'm sure some of the stoma groups might disagree with that, but, but I mean, the psychological implications of having a stoma. Um, I mean, getting used to knowing whether you do things like go surfing or swimming, for example. A lot of people do, you wear something over the top of it. Um, there's a lot of evidence that stoma maybe affects sexual function as well, that's psychological too. So those, the psychological and, and getting used to using it in normal society. In terms of ideal conduit and its other complications, um, 
if your bag's not fitting properly or there's issues with the bag, it can cause some irritation and uh, soreness of the skin. Um, the stoma nurses, specialist nurses, tend to be very good at dealing with those things. Uh, because the stoma is essentially a weakness in the abdominal wall, something up to a third of people can get herniation or weakness around the stoma. Many of those is fairly mild and they deal with it. It may affect the way the bag sits or have to wear a belt. Uh, a small percentage, it might get enough weakness to require some sort of surgical repair of a hernia. So, so I guess skin changes and herniation around the stoma are the two medium to long term complications that uh, you get from, from having an ideal urinary stoma. Well, if you follow somebody up after a cystectomy, there are two issues the cancer follow up and the functional follow up, um, which I'll deal with separately. The cancer issue depends on the type and stage of cancer you've got. Certainly, first of all, in a man, if you take the bladder and prostate out and leave the urethra behind, which is the lining of the penis that you pee through, uh, about 5% can develop similar tumours in that lining. So uh, a six-monthly telescopic check's um, suggested. Uh, in terms of uh, whether you should have scans, there's often, often no set regime, but if you've got an invasive or aggressive bladder cancer, a CT scan certainly at six months and possibly yearly afterwards to look for recurrence. With better drugs around now, you probably can treat early recurrence more successfully rather than having a more nihilistic approach of saying if it comes back you can't really do anything about it. Um, and I guess 10, 15 years ago with most cancers, if it did come back after cystectomy, you probably couldn't really do much about it other than relieve symptoms. Um, so uh, regular CT scans may be ordered by the doctor to look for early recurrence. Um, in terms of function, the main worry, apart from symptoms in a, a man, in dealing with incontinence in a man, for example, or a woman, or sexual problems, that's a separate issue that needs to be dealt with over months and years sometimes. Um, you have to be careful about kidney function. You have changed the drainage of the kidneys from a normal bladder into a diversion or a new bladder. So uh, I, I'd certainly do a baseline kidney ultrasound and kidney blood tests and then subsequently at least every six months afterwards to make sure the kidneys are draining properly and, and, and fully and you're not showing any signs of, of, of difficulty with kidney drainage or function. But probably simple blood tests and ultrasound for function and uh, depending on the type of cancer, a, a CT scan uh, at a frequency to be agreed with your doctor. Uh, well, the typical bladder cancer patient in, in Western countries is old. I mean, it tends to be five men to every woman. Um, well, that's changed a little. More women seem to be getting bladder cancer. Um, it tends to be older men, over 55, and a lot of them in the past have had a history of smoking or working in, in uh, old, uh, old-fashioned old industries, you don't mind me calling it that, you know, working with chemicals, rubber workers. Uh, so they had other health issues often, you know, chest problems, uh, risk of heart disease, risk of other cancers such as lung cancer, you sometimes find that too. So uh, if you're dealing with that group, you've got to deal with all the other things going on with them as well. Um, if, if you get a, say a woman, I've had a woman in her 20s with quite nasty bladder cancer, uh, you're dealing with trying to cure the cancer but also the fact you could be changing their life for the next 50 years you know, by taking their bladder out, affecting their fertility perhaps giving them a stoma or some form of change in the way they, they pass urine and uh, you have to then take uh, different quality of life issues into account as well as trying to cure the cancer. Um, so I, I guess there's a, a different balance between uh, tr trying to cure the cancer which obviously a young person wants but also accepting that you're probably going to change their life for the next 50 years as well. Um, and uh, that's where a discussion about alternatives, what, how radical surgery needs to be whether it's combined with other drug treatments, um, whether sometimes you can avoid surgery uh, and what form of uh, surgery you do and, and then how you um, deal with urinary drain drainage and bladder uh, replacement in those people to try and give them as normal a life as possible. But also, if they do get cured of the cancer and they have a form of diversion or, or reconstruction, they really also have to be followed up for most of the rest of their life as well in some way. Look, people ask whether having a bladder out and a form of diversion or reconstruction is a big step, it's something they need to go down that route. Well, the answer is you're trying to deal with a 
bladder cancer, which is potentially aggressive or may already have local signs of aggression, if it's left, it's going to grow locally and cause quite unpleasant symptoms. Bladder cancer that's uncontrolled can give pelvic pain, swollen legs, peeing all the time, block the kidneys off, and it's going to spread somewhere else and kill you. Uh, maybe that can be controlled with drugs for a while, but essentially once it's spread, it's going to get to most people. So it's a balance. You're going to do a major operation which changes a lot of people's lives. You put, it has some risk, even a very small risk of mortality, death in itself. But you're trying to stop a quite nasty cancer causing very unpleasant local effects, but also spreading and causing early death. Um, and that's where the balance is. And the best option for most people in that situation is to go for the surgery.